All right. So uh, we're going to look at part two of the vocabulary. And that's the second half of the story and, and Somalia, which has the short writing component. Uh, then we're going to spend a fair amount of time discussing Ishmahan's story. Uh, and we'll go into a breakout room to do that. When we come back from breakout rooms, we're going to look at Guy Kawasaki's 10 20 30 rule. So it's about 20 years old, but um, there's a presentation coach named Guy Kawasaki. He developed something called a 10 20 30 rule to make um, business and academic presentations work well. And it's withstood the test of time. It's still an excellent rule. Uh, then we'll take our break. Uh, then I'll. Well, actually, I realized I was going to do Guy Kawasaki after the break. Then I'll leave that last half of class for everybody to work, work together to prep a uh, Thursday presentation. So right now I see we have Lena, Anna, and Vladimir all in one place. So make sure that the three of you don't go anywhere and you sort out whatever you need to sort out. Everybody take your time. If you want to leave the, the Zoom call and just communicate on your own, that is fine. If you want to work with me putting you into separate breakout rooms, that is fine. Whatever you need to do, just make sure you're ready for uh, Thursday. That is it. Any questions? I really uh, gonna try to do my best. Uh, you know, I'm gone and uh, assignment, but I'm gonna try to do best. Um, hang on one second. Hang on one second. I'm gonna give everybody something. My my football coach. Used to my I'm gonna I'm not gonna say this out loud, so, but hold on. Okay, I can't look for. Uh, actually, I'll leave. I'll leave it alone. I'll leave it alone. All right. Anyway, so um, I'll find something. I'll show it to you privately, Caesar. You'll love it. Okay. All right. So let's uh, let's get moving. Here we go. All right. Second half of the Anna and Somalia vocabulary. We'll go over this together. I actually put it on, there it is. All right, so there's the second half of the Anand Somalia vocabulary. Yesterday, we went over the uh, first half. Today, we're going to go over the second half, which will clarify the end of the story a lot better. So I'm going to uh, underline one word at a time here. Everybody just follow me with the pronunciation. You can go ahead and unmute yourselves. Here we go. <clears throat> Warden. Everybody, you can follow me. You can go ahead and unmute yourselves. It's fine. Warden. Warden. Very good, Raphael. Exclusive. Excuse. Exclusive. Very good. Quranic verses. Quranic, Quranic verses. Quranic verses. Shakes. 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 I was saying it wrong. Shakes. Okay. Shakes. Shakes. Diagnosing. 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 Unsentimental. Very good. Unsentimental. Secret police. Secret, Secret police. police. Secret police. Cell. Cell. So. Uncertainty. 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 Dissatisfaction. Dissatisfaction. Confinement. 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 Very good. So what I'm going to do is this. I'm going to use 
one of these words as it's used in the story. And I'll ask uh, one of you to explain the definition. You can use your hand raising emoji to explain. So I'll start with the word warden. Dr. Abacor asked the warden for a book, just one book. So who is the warden? Use your hand raising emoji when you're ready. Anna, go for it. It is someone who looks uh, for something. It is the head of the prison. So the warden is the head of the prison, the, the boss, the big boss in the prison, leader of the prison. So the doctor asked the warden for permission to take one book back to his cell. So the warden is the head of the prison. All right. Exclusive. Who could give me the definition of exclusive? Go for it. Oh, actually, wait. Let me use you it in a sentence. Uh, let me use it in a sentence. Hold on. Um, unique. Yeah, you know, pretty close. Exclusive. It's more like, uh, well, let me use it as, as it was used in the uh, story. Oh, okay. Um, Privileges. Yeah, yeah, it's a, it's a unique privilege. You got it. Uh, yeah, yeah. I, I, Raphael, special. It's unique privilege. A unique privilege. Unique privilege. All right. Now I'm going to put these two together and actually, well, I'll actually skip these two and save that for the end. Uh, well, um, no, I'll do this right now. Here we go. I'll use these two in a sentence because they were put together. Some local sheikhs found Quranic verses for Ishmahan to, to rationalize Ishmahan's divorce. Some local sheikhs found Quranic verses to rationalize Ishmahan's divorce. Muhammad. Quranic the verse, I think, is the sentence from the book, from the Quran, from the religion. Exactly. So a sheikh is a tribal leader in Islam, and a Quranic verse is a text from the Quran. Quran. From the Quran. So the way people might say biblical verses, like words in the Bible, the Quranic verses are the same thing. So the character Ismahan uh, was put under pressure by local sheikhs for Muhammad, and they found Quranic verses to rationalize this. Yes, Muhammad, uh, <laughs> our Muhammad, not the Muhammad in the story. Yes, our Muhammad. <laughs> you had your hand up. Okay, never mind. Um, so yeah, Quranic verses, text from the Quran, uh, Sheikh's tribal leader. Um, diagnosing. Dr. Abakor began diagnosing Muhammad through the wall. What is diagnosing? Uh, Gustavo. Mm, is the result after the study some problem? Oh, uh, yes, exactly, exactly. Um, identifying a problem. So remember, the doctor said that Muhammad suffered from acute anxiety. He was sitting there just going crazy in his cell. Acute anxiety. Um, Dr. Abacor sounded unsentimental when discussing the uh, those, those days tapping on his cell. Unsentimental. Anna. Uh, the opposite is brave. A sentimental, think about the word sentiment. If something is important and it's like a, it's like a special memory that you want to remember, 
an important part of your life, you have you have sentiment. It's sentimental. But Doctor Abacor, when talking about that time in the prison, he was uh, he did he was very blase. He was unsentimental. It was like a, another day. He's like, yeah, 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 yeah. I diagnosed. Him. Yeah, 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 yeah. And he he described talking to Muhammad Baroud as like he's like a baby. It's like putting a baby to sleep. He didn't seem to to speak about Muhammad uh, affectionately uh, in any way. He took care of him, but he didn't think of him as like uh, an important person in his life. Unsentimental. Uh, like he didn't mind? Yeah, yeah. It's not so much he didn't mind. It was just like, eh. It was almost like reluctant. He was reluctant. Yes, he would help him, but he was reluctant to do so. He didn't... Um, it was like, okay, fine. I will help this guy. Let's say... Um, without a feeling. Without... Exactly. That's perfect. Without feeling. Okay, the secret police uh, blindfolded Muhammad after coming into his house with a warrant. Secret police. Police don't have uniform. Exactly, exactly. Um, unidentified officers of the government. Um, and next up, that's how they would communicate, tapping on the walls of his cell. What's a cell in this context? Room, room in a prison? Yes, that's exactly. Uh, Gerald, is that what you had? Gerald just raised his hand. Okay. Um, the uncertainty of what happened to his wife. The uncertainty. Share, I'm sorry. Can you pro share. Yeah. Can you pronounce that one again? Uncertainty. 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 Thanks. Not sure. Uncertainty. Uncertainty. The uncertainty was driving Muhammad crazy. The uncertainty. Then he didn't know? Exactly. Not knowing. Not knowing. That's exactly right. Can, can I say, can I say, for example, Caesar told me uh, tomorrow it's will winning, but um, I'm uncertain. Yes. You say I'm uncertain. Okay. And if he said it's going to rain, but I'm not sure, then there not is sure. uncertainty. Uncertainty. Okay. Yeah. Good example, Gerald. Okay. Yes. Take like a doubt or um, insecurity, maybe. Insecurity. Uh, a little no, insecurity doubt. is different. Doubt and insecurity are similar, but uh, uncertainty is just not knowing. They're related, but they're not. Not, 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 sure. Sure. not sure. Not sure. That's correct. Not sure. Yes. Okay. Dissatisfaction is pretty easy. Unhappy or not yeah. enjoying? Not satisfied. Not happy. Uh, confinement. And there he was in solitary confinement, sent to life. What's confinement? To get the baby. <laughs> Somebody and you can trust for the personal things. So uh, it's usually used in conjunction with the word solitary. So the space on the room, up to the room. He's or, confined okay, means you're trapped. When you're trapped alone. Trapped. Yeah. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. Wesley has got it. You can't move. You're stuck. Trapped. You can't go anywhere. So knowing what we know, I'm going to uh, look at these definitions of these two words in conjunction right what here. What's up, teacher? Huh? Trap. 
Trapped is confined. Trapped means you cannot leave. Okay. I am. Okay. I am it's like when you are in jail. Exactly. Exactly. So these two words in conjunction, Quranic verses and shakes. This is going to, we're going to look at this in context with Ismahan's story. So if I look at, uh, we're going to first read aloud and then we're going to listen. Oh, uh, let's see. Uh, so Gerald, there's a little static on your computer. Thanks. I was, that's why I kept muting you. <laughs> um, so I'm going to uh, quickly go to this page. Okay. That's right. All right, so I'm going to quickly go to this page, and we're going to read it aloud. All right, okay. Now, I'm going to, you'll see the bar on the bottom of the screen. I'll take it off so that everybody can see it. All right. Um, I'll circle this paragraph right here uh, and ask for a volunteer who would like to read that page, that paragraph right there. Gustavo, mm, go for it. Gustavo. Warning. Divorce in Somali society in Islam, usually the husband's exclusive right. Exclusive right. Are exclusive right. Right. Mm -hmm. But there are these warning verses that cannot allow a wife to choose to divorce her husband if the husband absent for some time and shake loyal to the dictator used to verse to pursue the wife of political prisoner very good very good let's stop right here so what does this all mean uh there are some quranic verses that can allow a wife to choose to divorce her husband if the husband's absent for some time and sheikhs loyal to the dictator use those verses to pressure the wives of political prisoners. What is going on there? What's happening? Mm, is something is right in the Bible, maybe? Not the Bible, the Quran, but there's a lot more. There's a lot more happening. Mm. If the husband not present, the lawyer is mm, approved to divorce. Exactly, exactly. So uh, if you're a, a traditional, say, fundamentalist uh, Muslim, um, then the husband reserves the right to offer a divorce to the wife. It's not, uh, it's not that any member of the marriage, any party in the marriage can just say, I've had enough, I'm divorcing you. The tradition is the husband reserves the right to grant the wife a divorce. But in Ismahan's situation, how, well, who could, I'm not going to say anymore. Why is this unique to Ismahan's situation? What is her situation? Because her husband was absent for a long time. He was absent for a long time. Why was he absent for a long time? Because he's in jail, he's depressing. Yeah, exactly. Does she know where he is? No. Exactly. No, she doesn't. Exactly. So the government just took him and threw him in a in solitary confinement. She has no recourse. She cannot find him. She has no word if he's dead or alive. So what's ha why is this unique to her situation? In her faith. Can she, is she supposed to be able to divorce just on her own? What's her situation right now? Yeah, she can. Yeah, she can get the divorce. Oh, no, she can no. get the divorce. Right there, Wesleyan, divorce in Somali society is usually the husband's exclusive right. So what does that mean? Okay, the husband has the poem. Exactly. So, in Ismahan's situation, could she just approach 
Muhammad for divorce? Uh, is, no. Exactly. Tell no. us why. Oh, or tell us why Wesley. And I thought it was. I saw Wes, Gerald's mouth moving. <laughs> tell us why Wesley. Why can't she just approach Muhammad for a divorce? Teacher. Oh, um, yeah. because, because of her religion, I uh, say she can do it. No, no. The question is, why can't she approach? She can't ask him for divorce. She can ask him for divorce in the religion. He just has to say yes. Why can't she just approach him for a divorce? Because she doesn't know where she is. She doesn't know exactly. what's going on with him. Exactly, Nico. Beautiful. Good job. So this is the unique situation. So the government has taken this man away, locked, the, locked him and a group of other political prisoners up, and they're putting pressure on the wives to divorce the husbands. But the situation the wives are in is that, hey, listen, we're Muslim. We're, we're not supposed to divorce on our own. If you want us to divorce our husbands, you got to bring them back so we can talk to them. What do you want? So Ismahan's situation is very strange. Hey, uh, you want me to divorce my husband? Show me where he is. You took him away. He's been gone for years. You don't tell me where he is. Now you want me to divorce him? I have to talk to him. I have to see him to divorce him. You can't have it both ways. So this is where the local sheikhs twist the rules. They start creating new interpretations of this religion for political reasons. And I'm going to underline it right here. So here it is. Sheikhs loyal to the dictator use Quranic verses to pressure the wives of political prisoners. What are the, how are they using the Quran for their own personal benefit or for the benefit of the leader of the country? Twisting it around, changing the rules on her. For the husband accent, teacher? Exactly. Keep going, Raphael. How are these sheikhs loyal to the dictator changing the rules for their own benefit? Maybe the law, the sheikhs loyal know the prisoner don't go out the, the jail. It's exactly. Tough. They've trapped these men so they have no contact with their families, but they want their wives to divorce them. But their wives are traditional Muslims. They say, you can't just tell us to divorce our husbands if you take if, if you don't tell them tell us where they are. But the government wants to have it both ways. So their tradition is that the, the wife has to approach the husband to ask for divorce. They can't approach their husbands because the government has taken their husbands away. And the sheikhs loyal to the dictator are finding what's called, we call in English a loophole, a way around the, the, the rules of society. It's like changing the rules in the middle of the game, changing the rules just to get what the dictator wants. So Ismahan is in a very unique situation here. So, so we're gonna, uh, yes, Gene. I'm Caesar. Oh, is it Caesar? Oh, Caesar. Yes, Caesar. Yeah. Um, it's about the the history on uh, in Somalia. Um, she, if she know where's the husband, she can't divorce. Well, uh, take a look at the line here on the top. It's usually the husband's exclusive right. Yeah. So if for a divorce to happen, the husband has to the, has to be the one to initiate it. If that's his role in the society, he has to be found. He has to be yeah. he has to be allowed contact with his family for the divorce to happen at all. Mm -hmm. So 
so that, that's where that's where just locking these people up and keeping them away from their families and society has backfired, has created has, has created a more complicated situation for the dictator. Um, let's take a look. Let's now let's listen. Here we go. So remember, when you want to listen to the story, you go in and you read the transcript. Here we go. Yeah. Hi, Gerald. In Somali, the man is totally authoritarian. Are you sure? Wait, wait, I, hold on a second. I missed what I missed. What Gerald said. What, you, what is your question, Gerald? Is in Somali the man is total or the man are totally totally authoritarian? Well, authoritarian? well, I don't think you could. Well, what, I'll give you a definition of what you're talking about. What you're talking about is a patriarchy, and that's not at all unique to Somalia. Uh, Anderson, you, yes, question? I'm feeding my, my, my word yesterday. I'm saying to Google Scarborough and Pearl, I'm thinking as wrong saying. Say, say one more time, Anderson. Yesterday, I'm feeding my homework. I why, are you saying, telling, why are you telling me that right now? That's homework. Okay. Well, why are you telling well, me? I think I'm saying it's in wrong. It's wrong. At, at this particular moment, Anderson, why do we all need to know this? Yeah, because you're not trying to. Uh... Okay. Anderson, thank you. Uh, not really relevant to um, whatever, not really whatever. TMI, Anderson, TMI. Okay. So let's go back. Uh, to the transcript. So remember, you want to listen and read at the same time. So it's a it's around about nine minutes in, and we want to le read at this at exactly the same time. Here we go. Support for NPR comes from FX. Of on street, and then again, and again. So everybody remember, right about this is what we did uh, yesterday. It was Wesleyan in class. When you want to re-listen to part of the transcript, you find the spot in the story. Hour, then wake up half an hour. Memory, but at night, when he can't sleep. So I'm going to go to this part of the story. What was the first sentence that you heard? So Nabat, which means peace in Somali, and it means how are you also, yeah. Okay, so eight minutes in, then you find that this part of the transcript. So that's the part where he's, he's taken away, he's locked up. And then, here we go. He hears a knock on the wall. No, but I could repeat that word all, all that day, Pharaoh, <laughs> without doing anything else. And so Mohammed can now spend most of a day tapping back and forth to talk with the guy in the next cell. About Let me get to that part. So Mohammed can spend most of the day tapping. Here we go. A little too far. Hang on one second. Ah, oh, here it is. Okay. All right. Because there are no news from, from the world, from the outside world. It's really difficult. There it is, there it is, okay. Okay, there it is. Got it. Memory, but at night, when he can't sleep, he turns again to the concrete, and then again, and again. I was only sleeping for you, maybe half an hour, then wake up half an hour. 
Mohammed would wake up from a nightmare, sweaty and in a panic. I lost my sleep. Are you awake? He tap. I can't sleep. I need to talk. So there it is. I found the spot. So this is, I'm demonstrating how to use this. Here we go. Memory. But at night, when he can't sleep, he turns again to the concrete. And then again. And again. I was only sleeping for you, maybe half an hour, then wake up in half an hour. Mohammed would wake up from a nightmare, sweaty and in a panic. I lost my sleep. Are you awake? He tap. I can't sleep. I need to talk. When I try to sleep, when I'm falling asleep, suddenly my heart races so fast. So I was thinking those days that this is the smell of death. What is the smell of death? I think it's fear. Mohammed had a lot of fearful thoughts in that prison cell, especially about his wife. I, I could not imagine how, how she is, because there are no news from, from the world, from the outside world. It's really difficult to imagine where she is, even whether she's alive. And there was a meaner thought as well. The government was encouraging wives to divorce their husbands. The government was saying you should divorce? Yes, because there are traitors, these people who are in prison. Even some sheikhs found Quranic verses to support that. Divorce in Somali society, in Islam, is usually the husband's exclusive right. But there are these Quranic verses that can allow a wife to choose to divorce her husband if the husband's absent for some time. And sheikhs loyal to the dictator use those verses to pressure the wives of political prisoners. Quite a number of people were divorced from their wives. I, I was thinking sometimes that she could. She was only 20 years old. They had only been married for three months. And he was sentenced to life. You think she's probably enjoying herself. She's living her life. And I am in this place. At first, it's just a little twinge of resentment. And then the feeling comes back, stronger and sharper. He thinks, she should be visiting me. But wait, she can't visit me. Nobody can visit this prison. Nobody can get in touch. And still you blame her for not getting in touch with you. And, and what do you think about her in those moments when you're blaming her for not uh, visiting you? You know, they're very far from love. You probably hate her at that particular time. Every time that Mohammed tapped one of these dark thoughts onto the wall, someone was listening, and the someone on the other side of the wall was a doctor. Dr. Adan Abakor is also an inmate in this prison. And as the doctor is listening to these taps on the wall, he's also diagnosing them. Acute anxiety here. He was telling me these symptoms through the wall. I should tell you that Dr. Adin and Mohammed were actually friends before prison. Yeah, yeah. The doctor was the director of the public hospital, the one who'd called him up and asked him for donations. He did not ask Mohammed to write that letter complaining about the hospital conditions. Because there were no press allowed, no newspapers, no free press. And that's the moment the government decided that they should do something about us. But if the doctor blamed Mohammed for writing the letter that got them both thrown in prison, he didn't show it. Every time that Mohammed knocked, whatever the hour, the doctor would knock back. He used to have these nightmares. So he jumps, he has a nightmare, and then he knocks on the, on the wall again. So I have to wake up and then again start conversation, you know, so that he can fall asleep again. Just like a baby, you know, taking a baby to, to bed and making him fall asleep, you know. If Dr. Adin seems fairly unsentimental about some of the more dramatic aspects of Muhammad's life... Just like a baby, you know... It's partly that these two men are such different personalities. While Muhammad described that nighttime arrest as a moment of shock and terror, Dr. Adin seems to have met those same secret police with a bag, packed and ready for prison. A bag of clothes and lots and lots of books. Huh? Why books? Books is the best friend in, in a prison. But then when you got to the prison, it was taken away, the bag... Everything was taken away. Even our glasses were taken away. And so... Tell me about the day you learned the language. Or learned the knocking language. Well, it was the most exciting day in our life. It was the most exciting and we couldn't sleep. 
We started practicing it the whole day and the whole night. And if there is a joke and somebody laughs, everybody starts knocking on the wall and asking that friend, what's that joke about? And that, that guy starts sending the message, the joke. And it goes from one It could take an hour to send a tiny joke from one cell to the next cell to the next. There were eight of them in this prison. The, the guards, of course, they don't know that we are knocking on the wall because they can't hear. And then when they see us all laughing, they just say, oh, this guy, these guys are also losing their sanity. Meanwhile, on the other side of the wall, Mohammed really was worried that his mind was slipping. I was frightened of going to a certain area in my mind when I would commit suicide without knowing, without wanting to. Is it almost like uh, the fear of going crazy yes. was making you crazy? Yes, the fear. The fear was, you know, you could, you could imagine people who were crazy and you could imagine that maybe going crazy was the point of no return. So you were frightened of that. While the doctor on his side of the wall... And I was trying to uh, counsel him and explain to him through the wall that he's not going to go mad and that he's not going to die. But you can't counsel a person through a wall. Months go by, then a whole year. Finally, it's two years into their prison sentence, and something happens. Dr. Adden is summoned to the office of the warden to get a change of clothes. The room was empty, and there was a bench, and they asked you to sit on the bench. And then he asked, he asked one of the guards to go and bring your bag. Just and, the whole bag with all your clothes, your books, everything. Yeah. And then he, you, op- he, you open that bag, and then he tells you to choose something new to wear. And you don't choose anything else. He says, don't choose anything else. No, that was the regulation. The doctor's getting his first change of clothes since he arrived in prison. And so then you showed back two years later to choose your next T-shirt. Yes. But then the doctor turns to the warden. He looks him right in the eye. Can I have one book? I said, that's all. Even I did not expect that he would agree to give me. So I just, I just tried, you know. And he said, yes, you can, but choose one of all of your books. So then I started thinking of the, of the biggest book I can take with me. A few minutes later, the doctor is walking back to his cell with the fattest book in his bag under his arm. You can picture him fantasizing about just getting to lie down and read. But when he returns to his cell, there's that sound at the wall. It occurred to me the thought that, why don't I read this book for him through the wall and distract the negative thoughts? Meanwhile, Mohammed, on his side of the wall, Here's the new set of taps. I have a book, a book, and I'll read it to you chapter by chapter. That's Anna Karenina. Anna Karenina. Uh. Anna Karenina, the famous novel by Leo Tolstoy, published in 1878. The English translation that they're using is 800 pages, 350,000 words, nearly 2 million letters. Each letter, a set of taps. So the doctor prepares himself. So to start, I took a piece of my bed sheet and I put it around, around my wrist. Like he's prepping for a medical procedure, wrapping the sheet around his wrist and knuckle. Because it will, it will damage my wrist if I continue like that. So then I started knocking and he started listening. All happy families are alike. Each unhappy family is unhappy in its own way. Everything was in confusion in the Oblonsky's house. The wife had discovered that the husband was carrying on... What that book did to Mohammed's mind? When Rough Translation... An epic saga for your next car. On his side of the world, the day that the novel Anna Karenina entered their lives marked a new phase for Mohammed and the doctor. Each morning, Dr. Adden would carefully wrap his hand and open the novel... Mohammed, on his side of the wall, would listen. When he was dressed, Stepan Arkadyevich sprinkled some scent on himself. Although it was only knocking, but it brought the whole story to me. Pocketbook matches and watch with its double chain and seals, and shaking out his handkerchief, feeling himself clean, fragrant, healthy, and physically at ease in spite of his unhappiness. He walked with a slight swing on each leg into the dining room where coffee was already waiting. If it's been a while since you cracked open Anna Karenina, here's what you need to know. Anna is a noblewoman in 19th century Russia. She's married to a man much older than herself. 
She goes to a ball in a black velvet dress lined with lace and falls in love with a soldier, Count Vronsky. He's kind of a rich boy, careless in love. Mohammed immediately hates him. It's because he's also in uniform, and I was hating anything in uniform. Actually, this is very important, really. Yeah, I really felt that. Right, he's in the military, and you were in a military prison. Yeah, I was in a military prison, definitely. So you really didn't like Vronsky? No. <laughs> So anyway, the soldier, Vronsky, he steals Anna's heart. He gets her pregnant, even though she's still married to the other guy. And then Anna makes a choice that really changes everything. Because instead of having a secret affair, like all the others in her social set, she makes her love public. She leaves her husband. And society, the Russian nobility, cut her off. They isolate her. Vronsky is a man, so he's pretty much able to go on with his life as before. But Anna's realizing how alone she is. She's staying in a room, wondering what Vronsky's up to when he's not with her. Okay. Just the same as Mohammed was wondering what his wife was doing outside the prison walls. Mohammed reads me this one sentence from the book. If you love it hard, sorry, if, if you love it hard, he would understand all the difficulty of her situation and he would rescue her from it. If he loved her, he would rescue her from her situation. It's interesting because Anna is trapped by views about women and yes. maybe desire and, and all that. But you were trapped by real walls. Yeah. He says it didn't matter how different their lives seemed on the outside. Inside, she was suffering all the time. He felt exactly like Anna. He also was jealous, crazily jealous, and also hating himself for being jealous. And all of a sudden, he meets this fictional character who is suffering in exactly the same way. And this suffering is driving her into a state that Mohammed most feared for himself. Going to a certain area in my mind when I would commit suicide without knowing, without wanting to. So it's now 750 pages into the book, and two months have passed since the doctor first started tapping the book letter by letter. Anna and Vronsky are now living in Moscow, and it's summer, so it's hot and suffocating. And on this particular day, Vronsky is off visiting his mom, which Anna hates because she thinks she's trying to set him up with a young princess. And Anna is in this state of mind where she both thinks that she's a burden to Vronsky and she thinks he'd be better off without her, but also she wants him to suffer her absence the way she's suffering. It's in this state that Anna finds herself walking down a train platform. The train is hurtling down the tracks and this thought possesses her. She knew what she had to do. With a rapid, light step, she went down the steps that led from the tank to the rails and stopped quite near the approaching train. As Mohammed is listening to this, and he's thinking about what she is about to do... I really cried. I felt for her. But he realizes his tears are not just for Anna. That's when I remember my wife. And He's remembering Ismahan, his wife. How much she, she's suffering. And, and yes, the book's the one that brought me back to think about her a lot. And he finds himself asking a question that in two years in prison he has not asked himself before. Did I do well in those few months we were together? Had he been a good husband? Yeah. Did I treat her as she deserved? And instead of thinking she's left him and also hating himself for thinking that she's left him, he's thinking, why did he take himself away from her by writing that stupid newsletter? Maybe we could have done it in a different way. That letter that got them all thrown in prison. Maybe we could have talked to them. And putting himself in his wife's shoes like that, it kind of took him out of his own misery. He could think a thought like, She suffered worse you know, than me because I was only in prison, but she was... In the outside world. He goes from self-pity to pity for her. Oh, I think that's related to the book. Tell stories fate. Okay, everybody. That's why I played that length of the story. So for those of you who have not really taken the time to look into the story itself, uh, while Muhammad is locked in this prison thinking about suicide, the story of Anna Karenina is about a woman who commits suicide. And as he's listening, just through taps on the wall to this entire 800-page book, for the first time in years, he's actually thinking about his wife's situation on the outside of the prison. So think about it for a minute. If you were Ismahan 
and you were under pressure to uh, do under pressure from the government uh, to uh, divorce Muhammad, what uh, would you do? So we do know what she did do. That is their picture uh, in the present day. But if I take this question right here, after years in prison, Ismahan is under pressure to divorce Muhammad. What should she do? Let's take it out of third person and try to put yourself in the shoes of Ismahan. That's the real couple right there. This is a picture of Muhammad, and Is Muhammad Burund and Ismahan. If you were Ish Ismahan in this situation, what would you do? Because she's under serious pressure. I mean, you know, when you read the whole story, you know, she loses her job because she uh, is under this pressure. So that's it. Four breakout rooms. If you were Ismahan in this situation, what would you do? Okay, there it is. If you were Ismahan, what would you do? Take your time with it. All right, I'm putting this uh, screenshot into the WhatsApp group. Here we go. All right. There it is, and now I'm creating four breakout rooms. Here we go. You can join your breakout room. Actually, three breakout rooms. You can join your breakout rooms now. So the questions in the WhatsApp group. Join your breakout rooms. <clears throat> 